Hello and welcome to Conservation Matters. I'm Shane Mahoney, and I have dedicated my life to the conservation of wild animals and wild places. I invite you to join me as I explore the science, the issues, and the challenges impacting global conservation in the 21st century. Together, we will seek solutions, and together, we can affect change. Conservation, after all, is everybody's business. One natural world, one humanity, one chance. Conservation matters. To learn more, please visit conservationvisions.com. Thanks for listening. Everyone in this room is, like myself, a beneficiary of a system of conservation that was put in place long before any of us were born. The lands and waters and the landscapes themselves and the wildlife that exists in abundance on this continent in your country and in Canada is not an accident. As a matter of fact, the future of wildlife worldwide is no longer an accident anywhere. It will exist in our midst and for our benefit and for our enjoyment only through the actions we take. There are no unexplored Edens, there are no great wastelands that nobody knows about where wildlife can simply thrive anymore. It will be by the decisions we make, the decisions we fail to make, or the decisions we defer that will seal the future of every wild creature that lives on this one planet that we share. We have inherited a system of conservation that is virtually unrivaled in the world. But it's not a system that came about easily. It was a system born of crisis. I don't know how many of you in this room realize it, but if your country had had, and by your country I'm speaking primarily to people in the United States, but this could be true in other parts of the world indeed. But here in this country and in Canada, if Endangered Species Acts had existed at the turn of the 20th century, at the very beginning, you know, most of the species that you pursue, including this one, would have been listed on that act. When we floated the Yellowstone on Sunday and saw a pronghorn antelope and elk and mule deer and white-tailed deer and then some bison, I can assure you that there was a time when that would have been absolutely impossible to do. We are, however, facing a very challenging time globally for wildlife and also we have our challenges here at home. And we are finding that the world is changing around us no matter how much we might wish that it would not. And in the midst of that changing world, one of the things that we are going to have to do is to find a slightly different narrative to explain why hunting and angling still matter. And one of the reasons they still matter, of course, is because they were crucial, absolutely crucial, to the birth and the implementation of the North American model of wildlife conservation, and they remain absolutely crucial to it. But I don't have to tell any of you in this room, and perhaps the people from Europe will understand it even more poignantly, but rising social changes are challenging some of the principles that we hold dear. And an emerging idea is that we love wildlife, and because we love wildlife, we must never see wildlife killed. And that if we simply leave wildlife alone, and all will be well in this world. But as Gray and I just covered at length with Randy Newberg, the business of conservation is the most complicated business in the world. It is the intersection of politics, of culture, of economics, of ecology, of every kind of social parameter that you can think of. Yet a lot of people think it's simple, 
And a lot of people believe that if you simply will it to be, it will be. If you are passionate and love wildlife, they will remain just because we step out of the picture. The truth is just the opposite. So I'm deeply concerned about the challenges that are coming to face the hunting community and wildlife in this country and indeed around the world. I name my organization Conservation Visions in the plural because I believe there are a lot of ways in a lot of different countries to hopefully achieve some conservation success. But here we have recovered wildlife, built an incredibly complex series of institutions, laws, and policies that keep it with us. We have raised billions of dollars through taxation on the hunting and angling publics. 75% at least of all your state agency funding is derived from sustainable use of wildlife in this country. So for every state agency that has an average budget of $40 million a year, 75% still in the year 2016 is derived from these sustainable use activities. So anybody who simply says, let us take this kind of activity, this hunting and angling activity out of the picture, must immediately decide how they are going to replace 75% of an average of 40 million across all the states of the United States of America. I do a lot of work internationally, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to tell you that the rising challenges to hunting are real, but we have faced these problems before, and we will be successful going forward, and we will protect this tradition and the businesses and the families and the communities and the individuals that are engaged with it. But we must recognize that a modern society needs new narratives. And so I began to think about what is an idea that the hunting community does not have to build in society, but which is already there, that we can launch some kind of effective communication process onto. If you imagine an idea as a jet fighter over the ocean, no matter how sophisticated that piece of machinery, no matter how good that pilot, no matter how many technological backups there are, if it does not find an aircraft carrier, it eventually crashes into the sea and is obliterated. So no matter how much passion, how much ideas we have as hunters, no matter how much we wish other people to understand, we have to realize that they already have a mindset that is changing as a result of urbanization, movements away from nature, and all the other social changes that are taking place. So I looked for an idea that we could land our narrative upon, and I began to think about the movement towards organic food, the rising concerns in society about health, the rising concerns in society about where our food comes from, the locavore movement, the 100-mile diet, the Neanderthal diet, all these kinds of things. And I began to realize that we had a story to tell which we have never told before. We've had our model of conservation in the United States and Canada for approximately 120 years. But when I looked to find whether we had ever explained the relevance of hunting and the relevance of wildlife in the form and the context of food, I found we never had. Now, when our two countries, Canada and the United States, our state and provincial agencies gather statistics on how many animals of each type are harvested, and some have been doing so for a very long period of time, we have access to a treasure trove of data which I thought would have been compiled. 35 to 40 million people in Canada and the United States every single year fish or hunt. 35 to 40 million people fish or hunt in Canada and the United States every year. They are harvesting an amount of wild food that is absolutely unbelievable. But we had never attempted to put this in context and to explain what it really means. And I decided that one way to show the relevance of hunting in a modern society is to land our jet fighter on the aircraft carrier of concerns for healthy living, healthy food, and healthy engagements in nature. 
and to set up a question for society that would say this. In addition to all the economic impacts that hunting has, how are we as a society going to replace the billions, and I mean the billions, of pounds of organic protein that are harvested and consumed and shared in Canada and the United States each year by these 35 to 40 million people? So the Wild Harvest Initiative was started. It is now in its sort of growing into its second year. It has a variety of supporters, which I will come to. I'm going to make this a very brief presentation because I'm hoping that there will be questions afforded by you to me, and we can try to build something of further momentum for this cause. The biomass, economic value, and ecological replacement costs of wild protein harvest in the United States and Canada. This is a photograph, obviously, of one of the great game animals of North America, but also of Europe. This is the moose. And the photograph to the right is a photograph that Kim took at a small butcher shop that is located about one minute's walk from my home in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is the capital city 110,000 people, but that's as big as we get there. Um, and this is in, obviously, the moose hunting season. This is a, an array of quarters of these 1,000 pound to 1,200 pound animals that will, of course, find its way into the freezers and eventually into the frying pans and broiler pans of many, many families in rural Newfoundland and in St. John's itself. This is a photograph that can be repeated across all sections of Canada and the United States. The game species might be different, but the process is the same. It could be elk, it could be waterfowl, it could be lake trout, it could be brook trout, it could be salmon, it could be whatever it is. Think about this multiplied by this, kill, this amount of moose meat here probably represents five or six animals. So that's five or six people. Now think about 35 to 40 million. So, we've had a long history of chasing animals for food. And when we learn to hunt, and we learn to get this meat, a lot of crazy things happened. First of all, we suddenly became far more capable. Our brains expanded enormously once this highly nutritious food source was realized. That process fed upon itself until our intellectual capacities improved our technologies of spears and bows and arrows and flint knives and so on and so forth, allowing us to harvest even more, and that in turn allowed us to be ever more successful. We are the only species that has managed to come out of one place of origin and eventually conquer the entire world, every biome, every habitat, every circumstance. And we did it because of the technologies we developed and we did, we were able to fuel that ingenuity and that capacity by expanding a brain that was fed by the flesh of living creatures. This art taken here from the caves of France and Spain was printed, was painted 30 to 40,000 years ago. And if you ever have the chance to visit these sites, you'll really understand what this chap is saying. Do you really need to post a picture of every meal? The truth of the matter is, they did. So, what is the rationale for this study? We want to qualify the scale and significance of wild harvested protein because it's never been done before. We believe that the understanding of the importance of wild game and fish should be of concern to everyone, including conservation policymakers. And I can tell you that in this world today, the access to reliable sources of food that can be sustainably harvest, harvested is the dream of every single government. The Wild Harvest Initiative will help to reframe the debate of the modern relevance of hunting. We are going to demonstrate that the hunting community should not be set apart, that the hunting community should be seen as one component of a community of people in society that use the natural world 
and sustainably harvest resources, whether that is wild berries, wild fruit, mushrooms, firewood, and some of us, fish and wildlife. And that we make maximum use of that food. And while that is a recreational harvest, it is vitally important to some families, still to this day, and by some, I mean a lot of families in rural parts of our two countries, it is important to certain First Nations, and it is important to every single person who undertakes that harvest for the spiritual, emotional, and physical benefits that they derive. This is a purely organic food source that lives in the waters and landscapes that have been protected through a conservation ethic in North America for 120 years. And despite all the changes that have taken place in this country and in Canada in the last 100 years, numbers of people, industrial development, changes on the landscape, you are still able to go out, those of you who wish to, and harvest this natural resource and share it with a lot of people, including your friends and neighbors who may not wish to hunt. As I mentioned, the fish and wildlife agencies across both our countries have the data. We are going to take it and under a very strict scientific approach, we are going to calculate the total biomass, the economic and nutritional value, in other words, how important it is in the diets of various regions of the two countries. And then we're going to pose the question, let's say hunting and angling goes away, you please tell me how we are going to replace this food and what the cost to society is going to be. Because instead of people going out and paying money to harvest it and supporting conservation efforts that keeps it there, we are going to have to find ways to take productive land for wildlife out of existence for agricultural purposes. We're going to have to raise enormous numbers of additional livestock and poultry of all kinds to replace this food. We are not talking about a hobby horse here. We are talking about 35 to 40 million people harvesting billions of pounds of food. We are going to calculate the cost of replacing this wild food with agricultural models. And we are going to incorporate as many different groups in society as we possibly can. In Canada, First Nations are critically important, and certainly here in the United States as well. We're striving for a deeper understanding of the scale and importance of wild game and fish to the livelihoods and economies of people. We will combine this data with all of the economic data that is out there on job creation, taxes raised and provided to the federal government, to state governments, and to counties and other zonal areas that fund all kinds of benefits for society. We will also substantiate the fact that the public and the private lands and waters provide a secure, nutritious, and cost-effective food source. We will increase the public awareness of the importance of wildlife habitat and help to mobilize greater efforts for its protection. While we will be focusing on the issue of food and how much food these processes provide, this recreational harvest, the ultimate objective, of course, is to point out that those lands and waters are there for us in perpetuity if we look after them, if we make the right decisions. If we make the right decisions today, 100 years from now, there will be people who will also be able to benefit from these resources, just as we do as a result of what Roosevelt and Grinnell and a handful of others did when they led the charge to rescue wildlife here and make hunting an integral part of our society. If we fail to make those decisions now, the future will be different. The baton has now been passed to us, all of you, all of us, to make these decisions now. Business, state agencies, governments, conservationists, NGOs, average citizens, to all of us to make these decisions. Not just for ourselves, but fundamentally for them, because as Roosevelt said, they cannot speak for themselves, so we will. This data, we believe, will enable policymakers to develop best practices for access to protein resources. I can assure you that if we were having this discussion in Africa, parts of South America, large sections of Asia, the idea of having a sustainable food harvest of this scale would be almost unbelievable. In those other regions, the harvest of these wild creatures 
are in many cases driving these animals out of existence because no model of conservation is there to support it. The bushmeat crisis in many regions of Africa is denuding that continent of wildlife. Now that may not be our primary concern, but as citizens of the world, it should be everyone's concern. We have a model here that works and that's open and free to everyone. We will mobilize understanding of working wildlife models. As I said at the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, wildlife conservation is not accidental anymore. It will only happen by virtue of what we try to do to assist it. The North American model of wildlife conservation is fundamentally based on the idea of sustainable use of hunting and angling. For 120 years, that community has disproportionately invested in the conservation of the lands, waters, protected areas indeed, and also in the conservation, recovery, and sustaining of wildlife populations. These are historical facts that cannot be denied. There's a burden of evidence upon them that is so large that no one can dismiss this truth. It will provide common ground for discussions and public engagement in wildlife conservation issues leading to more diverse coalitions. One of the primary objectives of my career and my life and the small organization I have created is to find ways to bring people of very different views together for the conservation of wildlife. And food is something that a lot of people care about. Not everybody who consumes wild meat, of course, is going to go out and take the life of a sentient creature or train themselves or study to learn how to do that, but they will share in the meat, as the statistics clearly show. In the state of Michigan, with deer alone, 26 to 33 million pounds of deer meat are consumed in the state of Michigan every single year. Just like in most states, a small minority of people hunt. That number is 4.7% in the United States of America right now, across the country, 4.7%. 95.3% of the community does not hunt. But with that small percentage of people hunting that amount of meat, one in three people in the state of Michigan share in that meat. It jumps from 5 to 6% of the people harvesting to one-third of the entire population of that state share in the consumption of that food. That's relevant. That's important. We want to foster, using some of these statistics, an appreciation for the positive roles hunting and animal play in our economies, our health, and for conservation purposes. I started talking about this idea about a little more than uh, a year ago. and very early in the game, some major organizations jumped in to help with this approach. And as you can see, that group included the Wild Sheep Foundation, who has been a supporter of many things that I've done over the years, and is now a major supporter of this effort. But the list has grown quickly to include quite a range of organizations, and I may say now that added to this list, which includes many non-governmental organizations, an industry partner, which that also is growing, some guides and outfitters, organizations, we now have the state of Florida. The state itself is now a five-year partner with this study. We are looking forward very optimistically to the state of Texas joining very soon. We have discussions underway with Nevada, Arizona, Idaho, British Columbia, organizations in Alberta. And the hope here is that we are eventually going to build a platform of partners and supporters of this that will include industry, NGOs, governments, but also people that are not from the hunting community at all. So we have had people who are raising free-range bison who have contacted us and said, you know what, we're sort of leaning in the same direction. We want to produce this organic food that everybody can share in. The Northern Chefs Alliance has been in, associate, or in touch with us because their restaurants serve wild game and reach out to the community through that mechanism. We have oncologists, cancer specialists, who have reached out and said that one of the things that they have tried to do is increase the consumption of wild meat in their diet because they believe the health benefits are really there. Once we get 
a few more of these organizations involved, you're going to start to see a very significant public outreach effort associated with this activity. We've already had articles in Outdoor Life and Sports Afield and a variety of other magazines, you know, uh, interviews with radio and television and newspapers and so on, but it's relatively small at this point in time, but we anticipate this becoming very large very quickly. If we get a significant percentage of the states and provinces engaged in this activity, the governments, and if we can unite the various partners that we have through the outreach for this, we can begin to explain to a massive audience in our two countries with facts and figures to show that instead of this being some little hobby where somebody goes out and for whatever reason kills an animal in a particular time and circumstance, that we are actually making a significant contribution to the food of the people who live in our two countries, we open up a range of dialogue that has not been available to us before. This idea of building diverse alliances is going to be critical. At 4.7 percent, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that the solutions to the conservation challenges facing wildlife does not rest solely in our hands. We have to build the strong coalitions for people who believe in wildlife and for people who accept a wide diversity of views and beliefs with respect to it. In the work I do associated with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature on Human Livelihoods, one of the things we try to do is find examples, small examples, of where conservation of wildlife has also benefited human livelihoods and human communities. Well, I don't have to tell anybody from the United States of America how we have made that work at a massive scale. Billions of dollars every single year are spent by hunters and anglers in our two countries. And that contribution makes a massive difference for conservation, but it also makes a massive difference for local communities. 600,000 jobs are created in this country alone as a result of the activities of those individuals. But there are individuals out there who are not interested in hunting, but who are simply committed to the conservation of wildlife. And we have to find them. And we in this sustainable use community have to work with them, and they have to work with us. We believe that by building this study and promoting it to a very wide audience in our two countries, people will begin to realize that this idea of conservation is not just some kind of philosophical thing that doesn't matter to them. But this food source has been there for generations and will continue to be there if we conserve these wildlife species. We are going to see a continued increase in society with concerns for health, well-being, and the origins of our food. And we have unlocked something in North America at a massive scale that we have sustained for a hundred years and can sustain for a hundred years more. If we do not begin to change and modify the narratives over hunting, we will see, in addition to a further decline to some extent in the numbers of people who harvest, we will find ourselves in a position where it will become much more difficult to recruit new hunters. We have to give them a message that matters to them now, not the same message that may have mattered to me when I first started. There's a reason why most of the new recruits into hunting are young women between the ages of 25 and 45, and young males who are coming out of cities, not rural America. Those phenomena mean that we have an opportunity to reach new audiences to bring into the hunting and angling world, but we have to find a slightly new narrative to explain it to them. This is one attempt to make sure that we do that, one attempt to make sure that we begin the process of thinking about where we'll be 30, 40, and 50 years from now. This business, and many, many, many businesses like it, are significantly dependent on the future of this traditional historic activity. And the benefits that derive from the businesses that benefit from it are enormous in this country. We have a social, ecological, 
moral and philosophical rationale and responsibility in my mind to look after wildlife, but to also look after the standing traditions that have worked to sustain it. I'm hoping that everyone I speak to will consider becoming a part in some fashion of this growing assemblage of partners. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that I thank you sincerely for giving me this much time at your event to actually present this to you and explain what we're doing. You will see more of it anyway, but I thank Sitka very much for the opportunity to come, be a part of this meeting, and to take this significant amount of time from the time you have together. That demonstrates in and of itself, regardless of whatever happens further in this, demonstrates obviously your commitment to these ideas. That's a great thing and something you should all be proud of. Thank you very much.